All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Jesse Zarrow, and today we're going to go through the ultimate guide to Koha. We also have joined with us Kelly McGillicott. Hi, Kelly. Hi, welcome. And we'll be going through just everything in the Koha community, including that Koha OPAC and the Koha staff client. If you have questions at any time, please jot those down in the chat box, raise your hand, go to the Q&A session. We'll be monitoring those the entire time. And we will also be saving some time at the end of the presentation so we can answer any of those questions that you have come up. Um, we will monitor them you know, during the session, but we'll save about 10 to 15 minutes right at the end so we can answer any questions that you may have about Koha in general, migrating, or just getting up and running. So what we'll do today to start is we will jump right over to uh, just a brief background about the Koha community. So the Koha community started back in 2000 as an open source platform. It's the world's very first free and open source library platform. Since 2000, it has grown to be the most downloaded ILS in the world. You can see libraries um, here in the US using the system to libraries all over the world in New Zealand and Turkey, um, Saudi Arabia and beyond. So it's a wonderful platform that you have access to an OPAC or an online catalog for your users to search as well as a staff client. So you can manage all of your library systems, materials and patrons in one spot. It is completely web-based, meaning you do not need a staff client downloaded on all of your computers. No matter if you're at your desktop, your laptop or even your mobile device, you can access that Koha system. There are two major releases for Koha every year. We were fortunate to just see that last release come out, 2105. And what the numbering scheme means is May 21. So we just had the most recent release come out and you can learn more about that release, of course, um, by clicking on the main page and that will give you just a breakdown of the release. You can see all the volunteers that are involved around the world and all the great new features and enhancements. There's always documentation available for your users um, where you can see the most current manual that will give you a breakdown of everything that's in that Koha system for you. So whether it's your first time learning about Koha, this is a great place to start. This will give you the basics of all of the different modules, including the onboarding process. Now we'll jump over to the Koha OPAC. This is a Koha OPAC that one of our colleagues, Lucas, has designed to show just the unique fashion that you can have the Koha display, tying in your library's logos, colors, and even header information directly into the system, You know, bringing in your location, contact information, phone number, and even your social media links. It's a great way to keep your users engaged and, and even let them see the hours of operation that you're open. Koha OPACs can be completely designed based on your user's aesthetics. So if you want to highlight some new titles that are available in the collection, you can do that right on the main page by creating a list or even running a report of the 20 most recent acquisitions that have been made at the library. You can highlight links to take your users out to maybe your website or even some quick tutorial videos that show them how to use the system. Logging into the account is very simple. Over here on the right hand side, you'll see there's an option for your users to log in, including a link on the main screen up top in the right hand corner. This allows your users to log in, whether it's with a card number or login that they've created or a password or PIN. If they forgot their password, they can easily reset it. We know how many passwords we have to keep track of. Sometimes we forget what they are. 
If your library allows self-registration, you can even register here. And what this will do is this will give your user a quick entry form where they can fill out the required fields and any additional information that they would like to track so they can set that library card up with the library. Now, as we mentioned, Koha is international and there's over 70 different languages that you can have your Koha OPAC displayed in. Up top, you'll notice the user has the option to switch between English and Spanish. So we have two options available on our OPAC. There is a home button over here on the left hand side that will always take your users back to that main screen, easily allowing them to perform a search. So let's start with doing just a basic search in the Koha catalog. Coming down, the user can perform a keyword search, title search, author search, whatever they're looking for, they can come and begin that, that search. So I'm gonna start by doing a search for um, container, container uh, gardening. We're all in that time of year. You're gonna know all my favorite hobbies by the end of this demo. Um, and that is going to bring back a list of results in the Koha OPAC. Now, you'll see right away, we have the OverDrive connection set up. And what that allows us to do is it will also search OverDrive and see if I have any books that will match that collection in there. Now, if I scroll down below, I'll be able to see any titles that come up to match. So you'll notice here we have some container gardening options in the center. This is going to give me a quick brief display where I can see that title, the author, the material type, the publisher, and then of course the availability. The availability will tell me if that option is available. In this case, I can see it's on hold. Or down below, I can see that items are available. So it will show me there's a, an available copy at the main library, and I can see that call number right next to it. Now on the left-hand side, I can narrow or refine my search. These facets will allow me to drill down. So if I was specifically looking for a nonfiction title, I could select that nonfiction and then that would narrow down my results. Once I find the exact title that I'm looking for, I can click on that and that will take me into a more detailed view of the record. The detailed view of the record will then give a little more information. Perhaps I can see the contents for that title. I can see additional subject headings where I can click on those and view other titles that might be available. I can scroll down a little bit further, see a summary. And then I can also view that holding statement down below. The holding statement uh, will tell me the type of item that is available. And if there were multiple items, I'd be able to see a unique row for each one of those items. In there, I can also see the location of that item, the collection code, and of course that call number, which allows me to browse through the collection. This is a nice option if your user is on their phone and they are looking for something. Maybe they're not in the library itself, but they wanna explore more of that 635 section in the library. This will let them see exactly what is next to those titles. In the status section, you'll be able to also see if that item is available. So it will tell us right away, is it available? Is it checked out? Is it on hold? And you can see that information. You'll notice I can also see the date that it's due. This table is completely customized. So you can tell your user right away, is that item on hold? When is it due back at the library? And what's the status? If your library subscribes to Novelist Select, you can even tie in Novelist Select integration where you can see similar titles and ratings and reviews and related content for that particular title. Now on the right hand side, this is where your user is going to be able to make any further placements of holds, printing it out, or even suggesting um, something for purchase. So here you'll notice if we click on that place a hold, this will prompt your user to log in. At this time, they can enter in their login or their card number and then their password. That will log them in 
to the system where they can then confirm the hold. Now, for those of you that may be in a special or academic library, there are single sign-in options like LDAP, SAML, Open Athens, which allows your users to authenticate or log in directly to the system. Once I am confirming my hold, if I'm in a multi-branch location, I will get a drop-down menu, which allows me to select that location. Of course, if policy allows, this will allow me to select my pickup and then of course confirm that hold. Once that hold is confirmed, that will take me into the My Account section. This is where the user can see any holds that they have in the system, any items that they may have checked out, where they have renewal options if applicable, or any type of fines. They can see items that are overdue or any pending charges. If you assess fines or fees, they'll be able to see that information and of course drill down a little bit further and see what that $10 is from. Koha does have a clubs feature, which allows you to track things like summer reading or an adult reading program. Finally, as we mentioned OverDrive, users can actually see their OverDrive integration. It will prompt them to enter that pin or password one more time, and they can actually see titles that they have checked out from OverDrive, as well as anything that they have on hold. So this is a great way for them to see all of that information in one place. They can even check those items right out from a Koha search, giving them access to everything in one location. Now, if your library subscribes to things like Cloud Library or Hoopla, you can tie that integration right in as well. Other thing your users will see in their account information is, of course, their charges. This will give me a better breakdown of what I have owed to the library, so I can see I have some accruing fines, and it does give me options for PayPal. This allows you to essentially pay a fine or fee via PayPal. This will take you out to PayPal itself, make the payment, and then PayPal will send an update to the staff account so librarians can see the timestamp, of course, of when that payment was made. Users do have the option to update any type of personal details, change their password, and even view their search history. The really nice thing about Koha is that all of these things are customizable. Each one of your libraries has access to system preferences, which determine whether these options are available to your patrons or not. For example, if you choose to allow your users to view their reading history, they can see anything that they've checked out in the past, like their checkout history, and of course they can view it by title, author, or date that it was checked out. You can take that privacy one step further and give them the option to opt in. So if they opt in, they can choose to keep it forever, to delete it or use the default of the library. Some libraries like to keep it for, let's say a rolling 365 days. So it'll keep a year back and then anonymize that information. There is a built-in purchase suggestion, which allows your patrons to come in. They can make a purchase suggestion for a new title that they would like to see at the library. Your staff will determine which fields are required. So when your patron is filling out that form, it tells them which fields they need to identify. As far as messaging goes, your patrons can customize their proactive messages. Proactive messages will allow them to set reminders for when a hold is available for pickup, when items have been checked in or checked out, and of course, getting those great reminders that items are due back at the library. Koha can send out emails, SMS if you know the patron's cell phone and provider, print of course, and then a third party option uh, by connecting to a automated phone calling service, which will send them an automated phone call. Finally, we have access to lists. And lists are what allow your patrons to essentially create a private list, whether they are working on a project with 
um, let's say a student, if you're at a school or academic, or maybe you're working on a DIY project at home. This allows you to come in, create a list in the system, and then add those titles to the list. Now, lists are really powerful and they work two ways. As a staff member, you can also create public lists. And public lists allow you to come in and essentially add items that you have available at the library. So whether it's a hot topic or something that may be available. In this section, you can see that we have some gardening tools um, that are available to your users. Now, let's go home and talk about one or two more things on the Koha OPAC that your users have access to. You'll notice right below the catalog search, you can also perform an advanced search. The advanced search allows your user to come in and perform any type of search that they're looking for, whether it's a specific subject or a particular ISBN that they know, or maybe even a Lexile score or accelerated reading level. This gives them the option to add in their Boolean connectors so they can do a multifacet search. As we scroll down, they can then narrow their results. If they're looking for something in particular, like let's say a gardening tool or maybe something from the seed catalog, they can also come in and select a particular location. So if I was looking for something in the garden atrium or even a specific collection, maybe gardening. As I scroll down to the bottom, this will also give the user ways to narrow down by publication date range, a specific language, location, or even sort options. The default in Koha will be relevancy. However, if they're looking for something specific, like a publication date, or maybe title A to Z, they can narrow those options down. Once they're done, they can perform that search, and that will bring back a list of items in the collection. If you are an academic or special library and you subscribe to EDS or EBSCO's discovery platform, you can integrate that information right into the Koha OPAC. That allows your user to perform a database search and that not only will search your catalog, but also the EDS platform. Now that we've done a quick overview of the Koha OPAC, Let's jump over to the Koha staff client. As we mentioned earlier, the Koha staff client is completely web-based. And what that means for your staff is no matter where they are and they have access to a browser like Chrome or Firefox or Safari or Edge, they can easily get into the Koha staff client and begin their day-to-day -day activities. Whether it's checking an item out running a report to see items that are overdue, or even cataloging a new item. This is where they'll begin that process. The platform that we're looking at right now has a permission level of a super librarian. Permissions can be assigned to your staff based on their day-to-day -day tasks. So in this case, as a super librarian, I have access to all of the modules in the system. So whether it's setting up a new patron, editing a course reserve, cataloging a new item, or even running a report. I can see all of those modules available in the system. You'll notice there's a static bar across the top. That gives your staff members flexible options for whether they're looking to search for an item, they can jump right in and begin that search, or they want to jump into another platform. Maybe I want to go into the tools module so I can batch modify a group of records. They can easily navigate through the system. They can even perform a quick call number browse. So let's say I was going back to those gardening tools. I can come in, hit that 635, and that will show me all of the records before and after that 635 browse of a call number that I wanted. Of course, depending on your setup, you can switch between Dewey, library, or even a generic schema. Now, let's talk a little bit about the options that staff members have. Over here on the right-hand side, you're going to notice I have a drop-down next to the East branch. So this will show me the library card that I am logged in at, 
And of course, my options to view my account information or log out of the system. You'll notice there's a help button. In the beginning of our webinar, we talked about the amazing documentation available in the Koha system. If I click on that help button, that's gonna take me right out to the Koha manual where I can quickly browse through each one of those modules. If I'm looking to start something new, maybe check something in, I can click on that and that'll take me through step-by-step -step instructions where I can see screenshots and how to perform that checking in of items. The search bar that you see here is going to be one of your most powerful options in the system. This is where you can perform a checkout or a check-in, even renew items. You can search for patrons and, of course, search the catalog. Now, depending on what module we're in, this search bar will change. You'll notice if we go into the cataloging module, now I can perform a cataloging search. If we jump into the acquisitions module, you'll notice that this now changes to a vendor search. So this will be one of the most powerful features that you'll see throughout the consistency of the Koha system. So let's start by doing a quick search. Now we'll do a keyword search on the back end for that container gardening. This is going to bring back a list of the results very similar to the OPAC. We're gonna see our facets over here on the left-hand side where I can narrow down my results and then in the center of the system, we're going to see those results. I can see the title, various information about the MARC record, and then I have access to jump right in where I can edit the record, edit the items, or even go directly into that OPAC view. Over on the right-hand side, we're gonna see location information. That'll allow me to narrow down my result to see where that item is and if it's available. Again, dependent on those permissions that your staff members have, they may or may not see these. Once I jump into that record, I'll be able to see additional information. I can again see subject headings, any type of contents, and then as I scroll down, I can see that holdings table. The holdings table on the back end will be able to see a little more information about that current location. I can see the status, in this case that it's waiting for an individual that has it on hold, the barcode, I can even print spine labels if I notice that it was falling off or damaged. On the back end, I can also see any type of acquisitions details. So if you do use the acquisitions module, you'll be able to see the vendor it was purchased from, the order information, and any information about when that item was received or ordered. Koha does allow for image uploads. You'll notice over here on the right-hand side, you can see an image of that cover. We use a free resource called the COSI server, which allows Koha to bring in images from Amazon, Open Library, and Google Jackets. This is again a free source that looks at the O2O or the ISBN number in your record. It looks for a match and then brings in a free cover. Now, if you currently subscribe to things like Syndetics or Content Cafe, you can absolutely use that information to integrate it and bring those cover images in as well. You'll notice we do have that Novelist Select integration on the back end. So again, staff members can see those similar titles, ratings, and reviews. Now for staff that are interested in viewing the circulation information, You'll notice there's an items tab here on the left hand side. This is where users can see additional information, maybe setting a loss status if they noticed it was missing or damaged or even withdrawn. They can see the history or the last borrower in the system, along with the total checkouts for this particular title. If they need to update any information, such as a non-public note, like they've noticed a tear on page 45, they can easily add that information in and update that information for that title. For my supervisors that are listening in, there's also a modification log, and this will actually show you any modifications that were made to this record so you can see that information and who the last librarian was along with that timestamp. Also within this record, you will be able to perform any type of edits um, at the record level or the mark level, as well as items. 
Now let's talk a little bit about the process for the user experience. Whether you have an individual that has just walked up to the desk and is ready to perform a checkout, you can either scan their card or type in their name and Koha will give you some predictive text to pull that account up. This will show you right away if there are any overdues for this individual or any charges that they have on their account. So this is a great example you can see right away. This individual is blocked because their fines are over the limit. So Koha will tell you why this individual uh, cannot check out. And as we scroll down below, we'll notice that they do have a overdue item here for the vanishing half, where you can see that information when it was checked out and when it was due back at the library. Koha gives you a one-stop shop for circulation staff. They can perform a renewal. They can even check the item in right from the patron's account. If your library allows claims returned, you can even perform that claim directly from that patron account. You can see the patrons holds any previous claims or restrictions that they may have, whether it's a restriction because it's overdue or they may have been trespassed. This allows you to add a manual restriction directly to their account. If you do use the clubs feature, you'll be able to see any club that they were registered for in the system. In the patrons account, um, you'll be able to see accounting details where you can process any type of payments or write off or forgive a fine or view the complete transaction history for that individual's account. So any type of previous payments or fines where you can print receipts, view the details, or make a payment for that individual. If you allow staff to view their circulation history, you'll be able to see that information all in one place along with the holds history. Again, for any supervisors on this call, you'll be able to see the modification log. The modification log will show you the librarian who performed an action on this individual's account and then the type of action that took place, whether it was deleting a message or adding a message, modifying their account, performing a return or a checkout, you'll be able to see all of that information along with that timestamp. If you send out any type of notices in the system, you'll be able to see a history of those notices, including the message that was sent. In there, you'll be able to see what type of message was sent. So I can see that an email was sent on 5-12-2021, and you even have the option to resend it. We know sometimes patrons come in, say they didn't get that overdue notice. This gives the librarian or staff member the opportunity to just hit that resend button and Koha will resend that message off to the user. You'll also see the purchase suggestion link over here. And again, let's say you have a patron that has walked up, they don't feel comfortable using the OPAC or um, they just want to tell you the purchase suggestion that they'd like to make. This allows staff members to actually make that purchase suggestion for them so they can come in and enter in the detailed message that that user has provided. Now let's take a look at the patrons module. The patrons module allows you to either browse for a patron, maybe by a last name, or even come over and search for a particular category. This will narrow down your users in the system where you can jump in directly to their account. You can also create a new patron here. This will tie in your patron categories where you can select the type of patron that you'd like to create and then enter that information into the required fields and any additional information that your user has provided. During the migration process, our staff will work directly with you to customize this form, making sure that it's set up in the system so you can easily access that information. If you're an academic library, we can work directly with your IT on campus um, if you have a system that allows us to bring your patrons directly into the system. Koha also has a tools module for your patrons that allows you to import patrons in bulk. So if you do get a CSV file or an Excel spreadsheet from let's say your registrar's office, this allows you to come directly in where you can import those patrons in bulk into your system. 
your patron tools is also where you can customize over 50 predefined notices and slips in the system. This allows you to make edits to those notices and slips. And then of course, you can set it up for each type of message that you send out, whether it's an email, a phone, print, or SMS message, you can customize each one of those messages that go out. If you use a language pack, you can even have those languages available as either English or Spanish and beyond. The list feature allows staff members to come in and create those public lists. So when we were on the OPAC, we saw those public, leaders, public lists populate. This is where we can come in and actually add or modify that list. So whether we want to um, add new items to that list or add a new list itself, staff have administration to come and set all of that information up. Now let's jump into technical services. There are lots of options as far as cataloging go. Whether you're doing original cataloging, you can jump in and create a new record in the system using various templates or frameworks as Koha refers to them that allows you to come in and create those records in the system. Koha also has a Z3950 server that allows you to go out to various targets and search for a copy of that record and bring that record into the Koha system. You can also use OCLC connection to connect directly to your Koha system. So you can search for a record in OCLC and import that directly into Koha. And you also have the option to do bulk imports, which I'll show you in just a few minutes. So if you're getting records from Baker and Taylor, Rodart, Midwest Tapes, Midwest Library Services, Gobi, YBP, you can easily bring those records directly into the Koha system. Now, what you're looking at here is the advanced cataloging editor. This is completely keyboard shortcut driven. So if you are a cataloger and you want to work as quickly as possible, this gives you options to quickly come in, create that record. You have the option to add in macros or text strings, which easily allow you to define a text of um, various tags and delimiters. You have settings, which allows you to customize text size and even font. And this will be specific for each one of your catalogers in the system. Now, there is also a basic editor. The basic editor allows you to essentially look at a full form that'll take you through 10 tabs across the top. Of course, starting with your leader and working your way through any local call numbers and then moving its way down to any nine hundreds or local fields. Each one of these are specifically descriptive where you can go in, enter in required information and begin filling out that form. Now you'll notice as I tab through the top, this allows me to come in. If I forget what a specific field is for, I can click on that question mark and it'll take me right out to the Library of Congress Mark 21 format. I even have tag editors. So in this case, I'm going to be able to search Koha's fully functional authority module. This allows me to search for an existing authority in the system, or I can create a new authority by doing a Z3950 search and going out to the Library of Congress names or subject headings. If you are looking for an existing record to modify in the system, I can perform that cataloging search. Now this is gonna look a little bit different than that initial search that we did. This will give us a breakdown where we can see that title. And then over on the right-hand side, we'll see an actions button. This allows us to either preview the MARC record itself if we're looking for something specific, or we can come in and edit the record or add or edit items. So maybe we just got a new copy or we needed to update um, something specific on this copy. This will take us into the item view of the record. The item view of the record allows us to come in, update any status information, 
change or apply a not for loan status and even specify a descriptive collection code or let the patron know exactly where it's at with the shelving location. If you use the acquisitions module, information will populate into your acquisition fields. If you don't use the acquisitions module, you can view any additional information here, cost, where it was acquired, when it was acquired. And then of course, scanning in your barcode and entering in any type of public or non-public note. At the bottom, you'll see options to add or duplicate or add multiple copies. Along with those cataloging modules, we also have cataloging tools. Now this is where you're going to do batch or actions to particular items for the catalog records, like batch deleting an item or modifying an item, or even batch deleting records or modifying records. This is a powerful tool that allows you to do these in bulk, whether it's for 20 items that you're creating for a list or 500 items that you've just weeded out of your collection. This allows you to perform that data. You can extract your data at any time, run a fully functioning inventory, whether by scanning a uh, list of items on your shelf or of course, getting a shelf read that you can go through and verify that those items are on the shelf. Koha does have a label creator, which of course allows you to create spine labels, barcode labels, or even labels for the front or back of a book or DVD. You can also import records in bulk. So again, if you do get records from an outside source or vendor, whether it's Baker and Taylor or Midwest Tapes or, or beyond, whoever you're getting your records from, this will allow you to bring those marked records into the system and then go through a rigorous staging process where you allow it the option for matching. So you can find if there's any match in your system. Um, you have overlay options, you have encoding options, making sure that those records, if they do find a match, that it finds the right one. Or of course, if you're bringing in new records from scratch, that those records go into the correct locations in Koha. Now let's talk a little bit about serials. Serials allows you to essentially come in and create a subscription in the system. This allows your staff members to also receive a subscription. So during the receiving process, it will give them the predicted issue or record number in the system. We can see when it was published on, it has the option for free text with published on, and then of course the option to check it in. Dependent on how that subscription is set up, I can either enter in item information if it circulates, and if it's a continuing resource or a pocket part, or even a loosely filing. Um, you may not add an item to the record. So all of that is completely customizable during the setup of your serial subscription. Once that information is entered in, you can save it and that will begin that check-in process. You can edit your serials at any time, generate the next subscription, or even print off a routing list. When you are creating your serial subscription, you have the option to essentially create one for your library. If you're part of a multi-branch system, of course, you can create multiple uh, subscriptions and you can even edit it at any time. Koha does allow you to essentially add it to a vendor. If you're interested in placing claims for your subscription, you can easily come in and add that information in. Once you set up that subscription, you come into the planning. Being part of an open source community, Koha has access to a MANA database. Think of this almost like a Z3950 server for prediction patterns. That's right. Prediction patterns can be <laughs> copied from another library so you do not have to start from scratch. So you can come in here, import that prediction pattern, um, and it will add it directly into your record. Once you're done, you can test that prediction pattern and begin the process. Next, let's talk about acquisitions. Acquisitions has four moving parts in the Koha system. The first is your budget. This allows you to set up your fiscal year budget. 
And then of course, adding any funds into that budget. The funds will allow you to essentially keep track of the money that are allocated to that particular budget. At any time, you can see a live view of items that have been ordered. If I click on that 8161, it'll take me directly in where I can see those titles, the order number, and the vendor. So at any given time, you can see what's outstanding, what's been spent, and then the total that's available um, and allocated to that particular fund. Step two is your vendor management. This is where you can come in and see any vendors that you've added into the system, account information, ordering information. Do you pay tax? Do you have any type of discount with that vendor? What is the average delivery time? Yes, Koha will keep track of late items based on that delivery time. Over on the right hand side, you're going to see any type of contact information for that vendor. So I can see my EDI rep. If you use Edifact or EDI ordering for any of your jobbers, this is where you'll see that information. You'll see here I have my Baker and Taylor rep set up for EDI. Step three, of course, is the ordering process. As we mentioned, Koha is EDI compliant. That allows you to bring a cart or a list of titles from your vendor. You can import those mark records directly into Koha and then complete that Edifact order right within Koha itself. During the implementation process, the Bywater Solutions team will work directly with you to set up those EDI connections so you can perform those EDI ordering options directly within Koha. Step four, of course, is once those orders have been created, receiving those orders. And that goes through the process of um, uploading your invoice and then receiving those items in the system. Next, let's talk about reports. Reports in Koha allow you to run any type of information in the system. Whether you're looking for a list of orders by a particular fund, let's say we were looking for all active funds in our acquisitions module, these reports will give you a quick breakdown in the system so you can view that information with, of course, a hyperlink into the particular title. Reports are run on SQL statements. These can be created from scratch, where if you know SQL, you can come in, you can view Koha's database at any time. This will give you a full snapshot of Koha's database schema, so you can see all information, tables that are available in the system. Now, you're thinking to yourself, Jesse, what if I don't know SQL? It's okay, there's two options. You can create a guided report and that will allow you to go in and walk through a six step wizard and that will write the SQL for you. You can use the MANA database. So very similar to what we saw in the prediction patterns in our, in our serials module. This allows you to search through existing reports that other Koha users have created and then import a copy into your system. So it brings that SQL report in there. You also have access to a Koha reports library and that is on the Koha wiki. And that gives you a long list of probably over 800 reports in the system that you can view that information and it will give you that SQL that you can copy and paste directly into your system. Now, if you are using support with Bywater Solutions um, during the training process, we'll go through setting up reports and training you on how to create reports. We'll also work with you to make sure any reports that you add in your existing system are added in. And then of course, you can submit a ticket at any time and ask for help on creating a report for your library. Now, once a report is created, it will be saved directly into the system. You can run that report at any time. And this allows you, in this case, I'm looking for um, additions between specific dates. So I can come in here, um, add my dates, and then of course run that report. That will bring back a list where I can see each of the patrons that were created for a specific category. I can download that as a CSV, a text or an open document spreadsheet. 
I can even create a pie, bar, or line chart. You can schedule reports to run daily, weekly, or monthly. So if there is an overdue report that you run every Friday at 3 p.m., you can have that automatically set up so you get the emailed results of that report. As librarians, of course, we love to organize things. So you'll notice in the saved reports library, I can also organize my reports, whether it's by module or by a specific department that's in my library, I can come in and organize all of those reports. In this case, you can see we have one that's a collection development report. So I can come in here, add that information in and run those reports. Let's finish things off here by talking about COHA administration. COHA administration allows me to set things up in my system. Almost think of this as, you know, what's under the hood of the car. Entering in my libraries, defining the item types. Remember in COHA, item types are what drive your circulation. So this is where I would define those particular items and how they are processed. You also have authorized values. Authorized values allow you to define dropdowns in COHA. So I can come in here, enter in or change the description for let's say damaged. Under my patrons in circulation, this is where I'm gonna define things like my patron categories, and of course set up and define all of my circulation and fine rules in the system. Now, if you are a multi-branch, you can also set up branch specific rules. In administration, you'll also be able to define all of your cataloging rules, such as those record matching rules we were discussing for import, defining your authority types, and even specifying which classification sources that you use. We mentioned those templates or frameworks that are used for your bibliographic records. Your catalogers can go and define which fields are mandatory, repeatable in the system. Now down below, this is where you're gonna see some administration for setting up the specific accounting types um, when you're receiving transactions in your system. And of course, EDI, if your library uses Edifact ordering. I'm gonna take us back to the home screen and we have about 10 minutes left for some Q&A. We hope you got a good overview of some of the Koha OPAC and the Koha staff client. We could sit here and talk to you for probably five hours about all the amazing things that are in Koha, but we wanted to give you a general overview of what just Koha can offer for your library. And if you are interested, we'd be happy to sit down and do a much more in-depth uh, presentation where we can go a little bit more into each one of these modules in Koha. Are there any additional questions that we can answer? I saw Kelly answering questions as they were coming through in the system. But if there are any additional questions that we can answer, we'd be absolutely happy to. Okay, um, when an update is released, does the library site automatically update or does the library have control on when the updates are implemented? That's a great question. So if Bywater Solutions is providing support and hosting for your system, we usually go between four and six months behind the master release. So right now 2105 was released in May. The next release will generally come out in November. So that would be 2111. Generally, we keep about four to six months um, behind, and that allows you and us to learn more about the release. So once that release comes out, our educators, our data implementers, um, our systems team, our DevOps team, we all start working on the new release, going through all of the enhancements, any type of changes or fixes in the system, and we start learning that system inside and out. Our educators begin working on a education or tutorial process 
where they start the training for anything that's new. So they break it down into different modules, create short videos, and even do live webinar training. So you have access to what's coming in that release before it's actually implemented on your system. When we're rolling out that implementation, we will notify your library and give you a window of when your system will be updated. If that window doesn't work for your library, you can absolutely contact us and we will work with you to find a date and time that works best for you. All of our updates to your system are generally done in the middle of the night at your local time. So generally like 2.30 in the middle of the night to try and disrupt as little as possible uh, for your users. Um, another question, can a staff member log into the staff client at home? Absolutely. So if you don't have an IP restriction on your staff client, um, as long as they have access to their to the browser or they know what the you know what the URL is, they can absolutely access it at home. Um, we have another question that came in. Can Koha be integrated with EBSCO's EDS? And Kendra, yes, it can. Um, you can set Koha up to work with EDS and there's two ways it can work. So the first is when we were looking at that Koha OPAC, um, there was an option to search via the database. And what that allows you to do is it will bring back results for um, both the OPAC and EBSCO's EDS. So they'll be able to see any additional um, options that are there. Now, the second option would be um, you can harvest um, data from the Koha system, and that will send it over to the EDS platform. And what that means is it will allow the user, if they go to the EDS platform first, they can perform a search and they'll see what's available in the Koha catalog as well. So there's you know two ways that you can do it. Oh, we have another question. Yep, yep. Any plan on integrating with Novelist Selects on the shelf feature? Okay. Susan, we can check with them and see. On the shelf, absolutely. Okay, are there any other questions that we can answer? All right, well, we wanna thank everyone who has joined us today. If you have any additional questions about Koha or Bywater Solutions, please reach out to us at sales at bywatersolutions.com or visit us on the web at bywatersolutions.com. You'll see there's a contact button in the upper right hand corner and we'd be absolutely happy to um, set up a, a longer demonstration or answer any questions that you have. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Thanks. Thank you, Kelly, for monitoring. Thank you. So of course, of course.